Welcome to Planet People, a podcast that aims to inspire curiosity and cultivate a deeper connection with the natural world. I'm Natalie Jane, a conservation biologist, eco-communicator, and the host of this podcast series. And I am thrilled to be sharing stories with you that highlight the beauty and importance of protecting our planet's wildlife. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Planet People. This episode is part two of our interview with Amber Barcera, CEO and founder of Wildlife Protection Alliance and Soul Sanctuary, an eco-lodge and retreat center in Costa Rica. She is also the former CEO of Marine Mammal Care Center located in Long Beach, California. She is an all-around conservation badass. My creative director, Coral, and I jumped on the amazing opportunity to join Amber in Costa Rica and stay at her retreat center, Soul Sanctuary, to record our interview with her in person. If you haven't already listened to part one, definitely go back and give it a listen. We covered so much about her time at Marine Mammal Care Center, about the book she created called Coastal California, The Wildlife, and more recently, her transition into her new nonprofit called the Wildlife Protection Alliance, where she bridges many nonprofits together to make a difference, which is featured in her Coastal California book. In part two, we dive into how Amber created her eco lodge and retreat center and her current conservation work in Costa Rica. Coral and I experienced the joy of seeing all of this important wildlife in the Costa Rica area we were staying in and discussed the importance of protecting this land as well as the indigenous people and the practices that have always been here. While our time in Costa Rica was magical and we saw all kinds of animals like monkeys, black hawks, snakes, we saw tons of cool wildlife. But we highlight the importance of minimizing the impacts of clear cutting. And this involves removing trees from land that is otherwise a wildlife corridor for species like the howler monkey to travel through. This is an important topic that we learn more about as we interview Amber. Please enjoy this episode as much as we did filming it. Hey everybody and welcome back to this episode of Planet People. We are so excited to dive into the second segment of this episode here with Amber to talk about her Eco Lodge Soul Sanctuary, which includes being a retreat center and in progress is a wildlife hospital that she hopes to build with a vision of rehabbing local Costa Rican wildlife. So Amber, what is an Eco Lodge? Yeah, so an eco lodge has a lot of different meanings, kind of like conservation, right? <laughs> There's sure. people that use it just to kind of greenwash their brand, but really they're not actually, you know, sustainably utilizing resources or paying attention to their impact on the planet. And it's just sort of become a bit of a buzzword. Um, so I designed this place with so much intentionality and I've always sort of had like a a drive for sustainability, for recycling resources. Um, at one point in my varied life of many careers and hats that I've worn, I, um, I flipped homes. So I would basically buy a dilapidated house, rehab it, make it new and beautiful again and, and resell it. And through that process, I really fell in love with taking old resources, breathing new life into them and making them new and beautiful again without just throwing something away, right? Like find what shines about the things and and make them beautiful again and polish them and give them a new, you know, a new look and a new color. But we don't have to just tear everything down and start from scratch. So. So I bought this place here in Costa Rica. It was an old hotel. It was built about 20 years ago and it had never been touched. And there was a lot of old wood. They loved to do, um, you know, good solid wood, but they loved like the bright orange, dark woods and that, th that kind of coloring that's just not really on trend anymore. I see. And I think the average person would have come in and just, you know, gutted the whole place because there was a lot of like, a lot of stuff that couldn't be used and a lot of stuff that wasn't on trend. But for me, like I kept all of the wood. I used to have this huge pile out front of the property with just 
discarded wood that they pulled up from wherever and we would use it. It would get recycled into like some of the bars that you'll see here surrounding the yoga shala like were recycled wood. The, the bridges that you see that are built around the property are made of old wood that like didn't have another home and actually most of the wood that's inside of the structures like the floors have all been like dripped and repolished and repainted and so they have this really cool like rustic but like trendy look to them right so um so for me eco lodge is like literally you know money where your mouth is right like you really are actually using sustainable materials you're recycling wherever you can um, even down to things like you know i use teak wood to build the shala which you know the yoga shala that we're, we're hanging out in right now and interviewing in right now um, you know teak is a renewable resource and they plant these big farms and um, so you're not cutting down the forests to build with right no clear cutting here exactly, right? exactly exactly and and I built everything around the tree like the tree you see behind you like a lot of people would have thought that was an inconvenient place for the tree it's running right in the middle and on the roof of the shala right like nope i'm gonna build the staircase around that tree we're gonna incorporate that tree we don't need to cut down trees in order to build our space we've got to coexist with nature as it is um so that's that's kind of the idea behind the buildings and the materials and everything is like very recycled and 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 up and upcycled and then um, also we do a lot with we recycle the water so we have gray water here that's used to water the plants in the garden and in order to do that it means that we provide vegan biodegradable essential oils bath products for everyone here which is a big cost right so it cost me about ten dollars a guest I source local organic vegan biodegradable soaps from a woman that lives here and makes them herself and that's what people use when they're here in that way you know you can say you recycle your water but if you let your guests come and use whatever soaps or the hotel soaps with all these different parabens and the and toxins and chemicals and then you flow that back out into the environment like you're not really actually <laughs> helping the environment and your water is toxic that you're putting into your plants and you're putting into the ground but it requires an investment so it's ten dollars a guess that that we invest here of course for everyone that comes here and then what's really cool about it is that it inspires people so then they want to buy the soaps i can't tell you how many times people oh, are really? like i want to buy the stuff i, I Do guess you have so, it yeah, for sale that she wanted to buy some of the soaps. yeah it, they want to buy it it smells so good and it's good for the environment i've had people here come and say you know i never actually thought about the fact that my soap or my shampoo or my conditioner isn't biodegradable and what is that doing to the planet and I want to be more conscious right and so it's practice what you preach it's inspiring others through what they get exposed to here um, we have a tilapia pond for example which is supposed to be um, you know I, I personally don't eat meat I'm vegetarian and I um, I don't eat seafood unless I know exactly where it's caught because our oceans are just being destroyed right now um, so but I do need a bit of protein so I like the idea of having some fish so I was like well I'll raise my own fish and I'll catch my own fish and then I can have some fish to eat and I'll know exactly where it comes from and where it's sourced it's not full of antibiotics like if I buy it somewhere else in some of these fish farms that are really again they call themselves sustainable but they're like destroying environments right so um, so just showing people like this is where your food comes from we have chickens um, that lay eggs and those are the farm fresh eggs that you're gonna eat with your meal every day and um, the water from the fish pond gets recycled into the garden and it it cycles through a hydroponic process where the vegetables grow through um, through the fish pond and the, the excrement of the fish, which is incredibly nutritious because they're just eating vegetables, basically, that is used to actually provide nutrition to the plants and then it cleans the water, which filters back to the fish and just creating these micro ecosystems, even just on this property alone, people come here and they can see and like this is something you can do in LA you know you can have chickens in LA you can grow your own chickens you can grow your own food you can you can use... live a regenerative lifestyle exactly and you can give back to the earth and back to nature and make sure that your your food so you're connected to your food source right so I'm vegetarian for the animals and you know I, I talk to tons of people all the time I have lots of vegan friends I have lots of 
friends where we talk about different things and I, I'm someone that's like, I, I preach like, you know, do, do what's right for you. And I don't try to shame people into decision making. I don't think that's helpful. I try to show people, I try to reconnect people to the things that maybe they got disconnected from, like Mm -hmm. we were talking about earlier. So, so if someone comes here and they don't like the idea of catching a fish, chopping the head of the fish off and eating Mm. the fish, if they don't like the idea of that cute chicken that you see in my yard, you know, we're not necessarily slaughtering those chickens, but that's mm-hmm. a chicken that would be killed to create your dinner. And it's mm-hmm. like just reconnecting people to some of these concepts. If we all realize that everything we eat has to be, has to have a life first mm-hmm. and you have to decide to take that life, right? Then you're so much more grateful and appreciative for it. And I'm not telling people you can't eat fish, you can't eat meat, you can't eat anything, right? I'm slowly nudging them to just reconnect with the source of your food, reconnect with the earth and what it provides for you. And um, so Eco Lodge, it's a big concept, right? It's a, it's a consciousness and um, an awareness that I want people to come here and experience. And it's also my tribute to this beautiful country. Like I try to find ways to give back to the local community aside from, you know, the wildlife project that we're doing. Um, you know, try to find people that work here that um, you incorporate know, are, indigenous are local knowledge. Costa Ricans and um, you know, like the gardener is is a local guy. And um, how would you say that, like, by working with these local people, you are in, like removing that kind of imperialistic colonizer practice that so many people in this area are coming and doing and clear cutting and and you are showing a different way of of living in this model like how is that being incorporated with the locals yeah i mean i'm I'm not entirely there yet but i've always been one of those do as i show you know do as i do i don't like that do as i say but not as i do i see that so often right and so I like to build it first, do it first, and show people how it can be done. So we have a lot that we're building a house on. This, you know, this will be our sanctuary business, and then we have a house back there. And you know, I'm trying to lead by example. I designed the whole house around the existing trees that are there. So the house will be a tree house in the trees, and it will coexist with what the landscape looked like when we bought the lot, right? And it's like, you can tell people something all day long, but there's nothing like being able to show someone and be Mm -hmm. like, look, this is how it's done. This is how it can be done. And I'm really hopeful that people will come here. They will see this. And I have so many people coming through that saying, it's always been my dream to have a retreat center. So maybe the, you know, maybe more people will open something with a similar concept. Maybe more people will see my house and say, hey, we can build something like that and we can, instead of clear cutting the lots to build our homes, you know, we can, we can actually build something that's, that's more in coexistence and in alignment with nature. And, um, you know, just trying to, trying to come in here and, you know, you brought up like, like sort of this colonialism and this perspective that, you know, this conquistador perspective that, that expats, I think in particular, come in with, um, you know, I just think that's, again, it's something that's a bit innate. It's in our history. It's in our lineage. And so we don't even realize that we're doing it necessarily. We come into these foreign places. We love them. We appreciate the beauty of them. We appreciate the what the land offers us. But then we want our creature comforts. We want to live the way that we lived. And it's like, there's just so much to be said for taking a pause, looking around, look at how the locals live. They build a small little house, open air. They don't even have air conditioning. And they, they are surrounded by trees. They have huge lots. They don't build a house that takes up the entire right. lot, right? They build a little well. They build a little pozo artes- artesanal is how they say it here. They build a little well and they pull what their family needs from the well. Mm-hmm. And it's like they're not pumping air conditioning 24 seven. I mean, this is another thing. Like I explicitly tell people here, like when you come here, we're on a recycled water system. Please do X, Y, and Z. Please don't put, please your, you know, your air conditioning, keep it at 24 degrees Celsius or above. Um, that's the best that's going to keep you comfortable, but also keep our planet comfortable. Things like this that it's like, yeah, you can pop over to this beautiful country of Costa Rica that's known for its biodiversity and sustainability and incredible wildlife and everything you're going to experience. And you can destroy it while you're here and then leave. 
you know, or you can come and you can immerse yourself in the nature. You can appreciate it, respect it, and and treat it with care. And I think that second type of experience is going to be what actually, you know, it's gonna it's gonna keep this place running for centuries and centuries the way that it does. And if we, you know, if we come in with our sort of colonialist mentality of just tear it all down and build what we want it's it's literally like the lorax you know like like when the last tree is gone everyone will turn around and be like oh we can't you know we can't eat and breathe money you know it's just but my hope is and i think that's something we've been talking about this whole time is like let it doesn't have to get that far right it doesn't. no it doesn't like if those of us that really care can stay the course and despite it being really challenging, which we can all acknowledge it is, if we can stay the course and, you know, do our best to lead by example, not by lecturing others all the time, but by example Showing. and education and collaboration, work with others instead of against them and, and respect, respect seems to be the theme of this conversation, right? Like respect the wildlife, respect the nature, like respect the locals, respect the locals and, and their practices and, and what when they're you doing respect, here. Right. And come here. And that's another thing. Like I like to serve local cuisine. Like not everyone maybe like is in love with Costa Rican cuisine. Like not everyone's necessarily tried it, but I'll tell you by the time people leave after the week, they're like, that was some of the best food I've ever had. I have people asking me for recipes. I have people wanting to cook at home the same meals and food that we had here. Mm -hmm. So it's like you come in and you're not so sure about it and you like your ways and your creature comforts. But like, if there's no other choice and you're just immersed in it, like I'm going to show you a whole new world, you know? And I, I like to take people on, on chocolate making, uh, tours and, you know, obviously we do all the wildlife excursions and, and connect with nature and the landscapes here, but I like to show people a little bit of the culture here as well, like chocolate making and the cacao plant, which grows here and, and we, you know, drink fresh local coffee and that's a, a big commodity here as well. And the fruits and everything that we have, like, I just really try to like connect people to the, to the local culture as well. And just while being very respectful to the people here, like I personally speak Spanish. I like to encourage people to try to speak a bit of Spanish mm -hmm. when you're here. You know, I, I know people that live here that have lived here for 10, 15 years and they still don't speak the language. And it's like, that's one way we can come here and we can show the locals that like we respect them right mm -hmm. and we we are here on your land but like we honor your land we honor your traditions and we honor your language and yeah we'll try to learn it yeah exactly well it's amazing what you're doing here and you've really incorporated some beautiful sustainable practices and the hydroponic fish farming practice is something that really intrigues me because you are recycling water and nutrients to fuel your vegetable garden and feeding the fish nutrient dense water and it's this positive feedback loop right and in doing so you are bringing backyard birds into your garden because of these native plants that are being sourced through this regenerative water and in fact in our second episode of this season with Christina Santa Maria, we talked a lot about the benefits of native plants and gardening and how that brings birds to your backyard and increases species richness. And it's so amazing that you're incorporating this sustainable practice and you are showing people that anyone, anywhere can do this in their own backyard too. It only takes that small action, that regenerative process to make a difference for wildlife and birds in your backyard. So how does that bring in more like sustainability and nature and diversity. I know that, you know, when that water is recycled, those plants are nourished. Yeah. So what does that look like when that comes full circle? Yeah, yeah, the plants are definitely nourished and and a lot of um, in a lot of systems, especially like in the United States and a lot of systems there, you know, we just generate waste and then we don't think about what we can do with the waste. And a lot of people might cringe and go, ooh, like, the fish the fish poop goes into the garden into the vegetables that you eat and it's like yeah that's a lot of nutrition and the fish are eating it's a natural the fish process are eating like vegetable substances and then it's yeah it's a natural process and it's like so people would just create waste and they would throw that waste away and it's like we're just so used to creating so much waste and not thinking about how that waste can actually be used to enhance our lives right um, for example, like we don't have food waste here because it goes to the chickens. Like a lot of people might not realize that like 
chicken, you know, composting and chickens, you actually have very little food waste. And so, you know, these are the kinds of things. And we also have a big community movement locally to, um, to have a recycling center that just is actually just getting opened here in Playa Grande. So um, things like that are so critical. We have a, um, a group here called Mi Bosque, which means my forest. And um, I worked with them to, like what you're talking about with the, um, this other podcast you did, uh, plant, we planted uh, 40 native trees on the property. Those trees were planted for the purposes of actually, um, we have a troop of howler monkeys that like lives in this area oh, and comes incredible. the property. So we're enhancing their wildlife corridors so that they can, in five years when those trees are grown, they'll be able to have a nice corridor that connects some of the lots. Um, and so they're reforesting this area with native plants, but also we picked trees and plants and things that would bring a biodiversity of species uh different new species uh that in to this area butterflies and oh that's amazing yeah and even you know some even snakes like there's some of these big um there's some of these big spiky plants that you'll see around i actually am blanking on the name of what they're called but they almost look like an aloe vera plant and um the snakes like to curl up in their reptiles and we have some kind of in the in the back of the property and sometimes you know small snakes like like to hang out in there and it's like it's important that everything has a, a habitat like there's some creatures here that you don't like some the ladies arrived last night and oh there's a gecko in my room and I could see she was a little bit cringy and I said oh those are your best friends they eat the right. mosquitoes they eat the spiders they see, eat the bugs has a role to play it does and it's like it's just education and understanding like a lot of people would chop the head off of the snake that snake is here to keep rodents away you know like like if you keep your distance from it and you know not Use saying nature we've got as a way to help you yeah they yeah. have a role to play it, it, there's a balanced ecosystem and if you throw that off balance because you see something as a pest and not as a helper right um then that's when actually the ecosystem gets gets uh dysregulated and we have major we have major problems like rodent and pest issues so right. and we're seeing other problems in this area as you showed us around so graciously while we've been staying at soul sanctuary which includes some of that clear cutting and those unsustainable forestry practices mm -hmm. to have these developers come in and and build and not include the land during the building process what does that do to the wildlife around here are you working with this local forestry group you talked about to protect the monkeys for example how can we improve those corridors to protect wildlife yeah um, it's it's tragic like when I first uh, bought this place two years ago um, it looks very different than it does now in about two year well in about a year and a half really because um, the first six months it was pretty steady and um, and then just rampant development came up all over here like uh, without getting into the backstory because it's long uh, you just a lot of development and not a lot of conscious planning and we're near a wildlife or a nature preserve and a yeah, national we're park right a, we're at the boundary of a nature at the park buffer zone of uh, Marino Las Baulas National Park which is a park for the leatherback sea turtle at one oh, time wow. there That's were amazing. which is an endangered species yes it is at one point there were thousands of leatherbacks nesting on this site and i think last year we maybe had 7 that came up and nested um, so just massive habitat destruction and development in this area among other reasons you know certain organizations calling themselves conservation organizations and then you know maybe no not action. doing the best job right. conserving the species but again a whole nother podcast just on that oh, topic yes, alone but, but the unsustainable unplanned development where they just come in first and clear clot a lot and you know then they design a house right on the edge of a national park sometimes in the national park sometimes corruption is involved where they're paying off government officials that There's are responsible for protecting the park mm -hmm. in order to build whatever it is they want to build on the mangroves or in the wetlands or in the national park in these areas that should be protected that are incredibly critical ecosystems and habitats that are you know mm -hmm. very very rare um, and it's it's tragic I mean at one point I felt like I wanted to sell and just leave because mm -hmm. it was too depressing for me and every day I look around and I you know my heart heart kind of aches a little bit more 
Um, but you know, I'm here and I'm, again, I'm trying to- You're showing by example. Show by example. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to also influence other, other people and, ha and open up conversations. And, and mm -hmm. also with my law degree, you know, find, um, find the laws that can protect these and be the voice for the animals because they are voiceless. They can't speak for themselves. And, um, and, and find partnerships, right? So often I find in the nonprofit space, mm -hmm. um, since I'm not exactly coming from the nonprofit mm -hmm. space and I have a lot of for-profit background, I'm, I came in as kind of a bit of an outsider and it, it's actually more competitive in the nonprofit space than it is in the for-profit space. It's a bunch of people with limited resources mm -hmm. thinking that like, oh, you're an animal rescue, I'm an animal rescue. Mm -hmm there's a scarcity of resources complex and then they don't want to support each other or work together and that doesn't help anyone there is a competitive aspect yeah. to it because of the scarcity of resources yeah but so i tried to bridge that gap with the book and bring all these organizations together and it was like people were like what like you want to feature or oh you want to help us fundraise like people were absolutely floored by the fact that like, I just wanted to bring us all together and, and Wildlife Protection Alliance is like the, the crux of that, you know? It's like, we are we have power in numbers. We do. If we can align and find the things we align on, you know, we can do amazing things. And if we're all working independently, we're gonna be so redundant and we're never gonna make any progress, you and know? it's like we all have a generally the same mission and, and yeah. desire to protect yeah. the planet, so why do we have to do it alone? Exactly. And that's really what we're doing at Planet People is trying to share these stories of all these conservation orgs doing the boots on the ground effort and promoting yeah. their stories so people can see the action that's being done and also take action themselves. We want our listeners to be involved and, and feel inspired and like they can make a difference. And yeah. It's really cool to see you do that in California and in Costa Rica and I think especially with all this development going on around you and you can showcase that there is an alternative way to live and live with the land and understand the local indigenous knowledge and really incorporate those practices mm -hmm. and how are you partnering with local orgs here to protect species like monkeys I, I know you talked about um, that the howler monkeys often get electrocuted by yeah. the power lines like what is I you talked about a solution there if you want to, yeah. to highlight some of yeah, those you read approaches. My mind. Yeah. so so my approach and it's been met with some resistance here as well I'm not gonna lie I mean I'm a foreigner mm -hmm. I'm like a white blonde girl I come into a Costa Rican country and you know thankfully I can speak the language not perfectly but I uh, you know I'm, I'm trying and learning and um, I, I can have conversations with people and it's you know it's been a slow process but I I found the people that like will sort of open up to me and trust me and I'm, I'm working more and more with them and one of these groups that I've connected with is um, that's doing incredible work is called Salve Manos and um, they're working specifically with the Monocongo which is the uh, howler monkey the population that we have that's actually here right in our backyard often they're in this tree that maybe they'll come us. by and visit us they <laughs> might we're, we're like calling them in probably when the sun starts to set they'll come in here and um, and we'll hear them loud and clear on the microphone <laughs> Just popping on here to say that we did actually see howler monkeys. Shortly after this interview, we were having dinner at the Soul Sanctuary with Amber and some of the other guests, and we heard these droppings on the rooftop. And we're like, what is that? And we thought maybe it was rain, and then we all get up to, to see what's above us. And sure enough, in the Guanacaste tree, there's a family of howler monkeys, and the sun is setting, the sky is pink. It was a magical moment, and Coral and I were freaking out at the baby monkeys that were just crawling around and on their mama's back, and even better, we got some awesome footage, and we cannot wait to share it on the Planet People page for all of you to see this howler monkey joy. That's really what it was. It was a joyful moment, and I feel like it manifested itself because we were talking about them and how we wanted to protect them, so it was like they were sort of saying, you know, we heard you, we thank you, and we want to be protected too. <laughs> like those poor monkeys are under threat from all this clear cutting in the area. So it's important to talk about them and it's important to see them so we can connect to the reason why we want to protect them. And be sure to follow us on the Planet People podcast Instagram page at planet.people.pod where you can see our latest video footage of the howler monkeys and just really see the excitement 
that comes along with it because all of us were very elated that they made an appearance during our dinner. Yeah, it was pretty amazing. So stay tuned for some more footage and we will continue on with the story now. But um, <laughs> but yeah, we're, we're working with them together to support their efforts. Basically, um, you know, when these developers come in and they clear cut, of course, what we'd like is that they don't do that. But the reality of so much wildlife and conservation work is actually just repairing the damage after everyone has messed everything up, right? Yes, and that's true. my org is very focused on that human interaction element. Humans do damage to animals, how can we fix it, right? Or how can we prevent it in the first place? So, you know, preventing it would be things like getting the developers to maintain the wildlife corridors, which means mapping the corridors. So we were involved with oh, that's cool. a study with uh, Salve Manos where um, we have a biologist that works for Wildlife Protection Alliance. We hosted their biologist here at Soul Sanctuary and did a survey of this whole area and where are the monkeys spending their time, oh, cool. what are they eating, what's their area, and what's their corridor so that we know that's where cool. we need to protect the area. What did your data indicate? Well, the data indicated, you know, we, we learned how many different troops there were and, and how many individuals we have. And then we learned the hot spots where there's threats, where they might be getting electrocuted, where there's gaps in the corridor. So they're going to have to use these hot electrical lines in order to cross. And then the second component after having that study was to fundraise for wildlife bridges so that we can basically bridge those lines um, so that the monkeys aren't getting electrocuted. But um, this is going to kind of segue nicely into what's beneath us, which is the budding wildlife hospital that, that I'm building. Mm -hmm. um, but right now, you know, we're trying to work for these bridges and, and this organization has been been really amazing and done incredible work here mapping everything out and we are just now ready to start putting these bridges together so it's going to help the monkeys it's going to help all different species of monkeys that we have here um, with a focus on the howler population because they're an arboreal species so they literally can't get down on the ground to pass mm. so they have to go tree to tree to tree oh, right I see. so and it's like these are the things that like the developers just don't know they're like oh well if we cut the trees down like the monkey can just crawl across like, no, mm -hmm. it can't. If it crawls across, it faces, first of all, that's not innate for it. So that would be unusual behavior for the animal. That would be like, you would be changing the evolutionary behavior of an animal. And then it's dangerous because of, of predators, right? And it's dangerous because then they could get hit by the cars, right? So we also- That would be so tragic. Not only do we cut the trees down, but we build roads. <laughs> You know, we build the roads, and so then Fragment we've, habitat we've, we've, and yeah. The trees. So then we drive our cars, and we hit these animals. So, so there's really no safe way for them. So these bridges are absolutely critical, and um, we're so grateful that you know Salve Manos has opened arms to our organization to work with us, and you know we just want to spread the word about the great work that they're doing, and they're not just here in Playa Grande, where we're focused. Um, at the moment, but they're, you know, all over the Guanacaste region of Costa Rica doing doing really wonderful work and also helping when the animals are injured. And just so for our listeners to better understand, I wanted to clarify that these clear-cutting practices are unsustainable, especially for these arboreal species that Amber said, these monkeys need trees to cross. And when our roads are in the way, and we cut down trees to build roads in these houses, monkeys are left with only power lines to cross and this causes them to get electrocuted and sometimes die. And so we really are so grateful that Amber is here working with these local communities to build these wildlife bridges for monkeys. And in fact, we actually saw this happen yeah, you got in real so time. so lucky that you happened to be here at yeah. the right time. And so the right monkey time, right crossed yeah. the bridge. And it kind of looks like a ladder where there are two strings that are attached to help the monkeys cross the road. And even though it might not look like much, these monkeys are actually using it as they're close to the power line. They can, instead of getting electrocuted, this is an alternative route for them to take to cross the road. Exactly. And so it's really cool that we got to see that happen and just this impact, like you said, save one life. Yeah. And that's happening right here in real time. And wildlife crossings are so important in California. We see the, the Annenberg Bridge yeah. in Agora Hills. That's gonna save the mountain lines in Santa Monica yeah. by, by bridging those two different habitats. So it's like where we can see those 
small scale efforts happen is it's just incredible and so amazing Amber you've only been here for a short while and you're already having such a great impact on protecting these species like the howler monkey and um, we're so grateful and it's awesome that I got to see it in real time I mean how cool is that that yeah. it's, it's really working and these are the solutions that we need to see and put into practice yeah to protect our wildlife well I think it's just it's it was serendipitous that you guys have to be here at that time but you know once we and that's just like that's the beginning right so the project is going to have I think over 20 bridges that are going to be installed that's incredible and, um, yeah like so my theory is like a bit of both right so I'd love to prevent the harm in the first place if my work was not really needed at all because the animals were being protected the wildlife corridors were you know cohesive with nature and the animals weren't getting electrocuted they weren't getting hit by cars and they were healthy and thriving, then I would never need to have a wildlife hospital to support these animals. And we wouldn't need to build bridges because everything would be perfect. So in my ideal world, I have nothing to do, right? But that's not the world that we live in right now. And so there's, it's like this balancing up between like, what can we do to try to push forward toward the ideal world while also stopping the damage that's already happening and so there's kind of two components to the work that we do at wildlife protection alliance like there's this preventative and educative and and um philosophical sort of approach that we have to like how can we do better for the future and then there's this okay, the damage that's being done right now, the human interaction that's causing harm, how do we remediate that damage immediately, and right? And that's really that social ecological component that mm -hmm. I like to talk about on the podcast is how do these natural cycles and systems operate with the social aspect that humans bring into play? Different nonprofits, different stakeholders, anybody involved in either the protection or the destruction of our environment, We ultimately have to find a balanced stakeholder solution yeah. and that's what the power is in coming together in numbers yeah. and in aligning ourselves with with protection and and so that social ecology can work in harmony yeah. so to prevent that destruction how are you combating wildlife damage here in Costa Rica. I know you mentioned you have a wildlife hospital. Do you plan to rehab monkeys if that's the case when it does open? What yeah. will that look like? So right now I just sort of have the structure of the hospital built and thanks to a generous donor of ours in the States, um, a foundation, we actually just recently got a grant so we can complete um, the fixtures in the hospital so we'll be able to buy things like the fridge and the the temperature control climate control for the um, habitats where the animals will be kept we'll be able to provide the um, crates where, where we'll keep them and incubators for baby animals and um, really basically finish sort of like the the structure and the fixtures of of the hospital and then you know second phase is going to be or I guess third phase is going to be um, the you know having medicine and some of the medical equipment and things like that but you know we are I already have vets from all over the world that are wildlife vets Amazing. that want to come down here and work with the wildlife I want to bring volunteers down here whether My it's gosh, vet techs we'll or people that are just you know biologists whether it's people that are just interested in working with wildlife and you know having them be able to have that special volunteer experience with animals that I believe creates the connection that people want, but doesn't create the harm, right? So we're having these special connective experiences, but we're doing it in a way that's, you know, it's remediating the harm that's already suffered by the animal. And um, I plan to have this place be, be healing for animals and humans together, right? So we're healing animals, we're healing nature, and through that we're healing ourselves. And the whole inspiration behind this place is basically when I was at Marine Mammal Care Center, you know, and we're struggling and we're about to close down our doors, even though we're doing critical work for wildlife, I spent 90% of my time just focusing on fundraising, right, as a CEO. And that just shouldn't be the way it is. I should be a CEO spending the majority of my time doing policy work, doing advocacy work, organizing things so that we can be as successful as possible and help as many animals as possible. So my idea with this center is that people come here, they get to reconnect with nature, experience it, they get to see the hospital and the work that we're doing, and hopefully it generates enough funding to keep the work we're doing all over the world, the education, the wildlife viewing guidelines, 
and the boots on the ground conservation work that we're doing. And we, and we also donate to other organizations as well around the world. So if these organizations, you know, that are in the book are doing great work, then like we might either directly donate from my alliance or we might bring a donor to them and get donations totally. for them. Um, so, so this is my thinking is that basically creating this ecosystem where the money flows freely to, the, to do the good work that we want to do. So all the proceeds from my retreat center are going back to, to wildlife and to this nonprofit and um, people are like, well, what can I do to help? And it's, it's, it's here, I made it really easy. You, lit you literally come and you stay and you go on vacation in Costa Rica and you get to hang out with animals and you get to do yoga and you get to relax and you get to walk to the beach and swim in the ocean and maybe we dive and maybe we snorkel and maybe we hike and go play in the pool and go kayaking in this estuary which is like the most beautiful experience and you pay for that and guess what that money goes to support wildlife it goes to great causes and you know that you know your your dollar is actually literally saving a life right so sol yeah so that's that's what i tried to do here you know it remains to be seen if it will be successful if, it already is successful well thank you i love that i love that <laughs> like oh yeah but i need yes, a cheerleader you're but, doing great you know, if if i do have success with this model my hope is when you, you know to open these yeah when, when. not if <laughs> when <laughs> <laughs> My hope is that, you know, it doesn't stop in Costa Rica. There are so many places around the world. Africa has my eye. Bolivia has my eye because um, there's a massive jaguar population down there that's um, under threat, which is a whole nother conversation. Wow. But nothing can stop um, Amber. <laughs> well, you know, and it's like, but but resources will. Sure. Resources will. Right. And so how do we how do we get the resources? resources? Right. And we have the dollars. People want to go on vacation. They want to experience wildlife experiences they want to connect with nature they want to relax but you know instead of throwing their money at the four seasons who says they're an environmentally friendly right. hotel no offense to the four seasons i'm sure they're doing some decent work but you know you you come here and you really know that your dollars are really supporting um supporting the local community supporting the local wildlife and um saving a life and it's pretty incredible being here with you and Coral. We're so grateful for you hosting us. And just over these last two days alone of being here, we've seen so much life that you speak of. And this experience that you can provide for us and other people is, is really a magical one, connecting us to the land and, and to the water and to the estuaries. And, and we were so fortunate enough to actually go kayaking during sunset through this beautiful estuary. It's a, it's a marine hotspot for not just marine life, but for tons of birds. Yeah. And it was amazing. We saw so many different bird species. We saw so many different, I mean, more than 10 species that yeah. I can count in just yeah. an hour, yeah. which speaks to the high volume of, of animals and just biodiversity in Costa yeah. Rica in general. The yeah. little blue heron, um, the Laura, the green yeah, parrot, yeah. right? The we Laura. We saw some Laura. We heard a crocodile. Yeah. We thought it was a boat engine, but we're pretty sure it was a crocodile, <laughs> like <laughs> kayaking through and seeing howler monkeys. And, and again, we had a local tour guide, people who know the land. And I thought that was yeah. really special that our yeah. guide was so knowledgeable and, and he took us and on a Costa walk. Costa Rican too, and yeah. It's, it's sharing that knowledge while we walk through the land and kayak yeah. through the land and tell the stories of yeah. the species and take time to look and hear what's around us. And we had such a beautiful experience last night. I'll never forget that. And it was so fun. So thank you so much for hosting oh, us. you're welcome. <laughs> I'm so glad you guys came down and yeah. that we can get the word out together about mm -hmm. this place. You know, like the, this, the success here is going to be the success of you know, hopefully we can replicate this model all over the world. And um, and it's really, we're here at a pivotal time because like I said, two years ago, this place was relatively pristine, Playa Grande, and pretty untouched. There was some development here, but nothing like what's it's happening quite now. Rampant. And, um, you know, I know I came here at the right time, as hard as it is, and you're here at the right time, mm -hmm. helping me share and get this message out. Um, that estuary, it's a Ramsar certified 
area. It's um, it's just an incredibly biodiverse uh, mangrove forest wetland that um, you know the the sequestration that's happening there is is so profound that basically you know this international organization is is willing to certify that it's a critical habitat. What makes not it so just critical? for the species? Well, diversity of species that live there, endangered species, and then also the mangroves and the wetland habitat that's um, sequestering the carbon Absolutely. is just is is so important with climate change and everything we have right. going on right now so when we damage these incredible habitats you're not just losing biodiversity you're not losing an endangering species or ex or extinguishing species but you're hurting yourself right like we can't we can't breathe without oxygen you know and we're creating so much carbon dioxide so things like mangrove forests are incredibly critical for for sequestration and and people don't maybe understand some of the science behind that and for our listeners who are new to learning about an estuary and a wetland and mangroves i just wanted to kind of highlight those definitions so you can better understand a wetland is an area of water where the soil is covered and water is present either at the surface of the soil or at varying times of the year. So the tide can really change how the estuary looks as water fluctuates in and out. And these wetlands and estuaries are critical for spawning of, of rebirth of fish, for act as a food source, for tons and tons of different bird species that we were so lucky to see here in Costa Rica on our kayaking tour. And in addition to being a necessary hotspot for this rebirth of life, mangroves and the surrounding forest ecosystem act as a carbon sequestration. So what does that mean? Carbon sequestration is a natural or artificial process by which carbon dioxide is removed from the atmosphere and held in solid or liquid form. And that's why these mangroves and estuaries are highly important for bringing in this carbon and acting as a sink to remove this carbon from the atmosphere. So it's a natural process that helps with pollution and, and removes this carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in a natural way. So by protecting and preserving these estuaries, we are protecting ourselves by removing pollution from the atmosphere. And that's why carbon sinks such as estuaries and mangroves are just a necessary part of the ecosystem of life where things recycle and, and give rebirth and restore. And we see that happening here in Costa Rica with this Ramsar certified area, which is a critical habitat zone for rebirth of fish who spawn in these wetlands and move out to sea as the tides change throughout the year. In addition to that, we see crocodiles and birds and, and tons of different species. I know I mentioned that, but it's just so necessary that we protect these areas and protect ourselves in the process. I just need to understand that, look, this is life. a really <laughs> incredible natural resource that we have and it's an internationally recognized habitat. And then the developers here, they just wanna build condos on it and mm -hmm. they're not gonna pay attention to what they're doing or what they're chopping down. And they're already clear cutting some of these areas right. that are within the Ramsar certified protected area. So how can we prevent that from happening to our listeners tuning in that maybe have a service they can provide or want to help like what are things that we can do to make sure that this Ramsar certified zone stays protected and is free of motor noises through through the estuary yeah. and developers building condos on the water like we need more law enforcement it sounds like but if there are people who want to help that are listening what mm -hmm. are some things maybe that we can do to help. Yeah, well that's, thank you for asking. And you know, obviously your support as a wildlife biologist, if there's other wildlife biologists out there, geologists, people that want to come for a trip mappers. down to Costa Rica, mappers, mappers I know you mentioned right? mapping as yeah, well. Yeah, um, you know, we always need uh, just citizen scientists, people that are willing to walk the area and take photographs. It's the, That's the best way to document what's happening to these areas. and. A drone um, pilot even. Right, exactly. Um, so there's a host of different people. If you're interested and you feel the call, you know, and you want to come on a trip to Costa Rica and explore, do these tours and check out the area and, um, and you know, spreading the message and spreading the word. And um, if people want to connect and reach out with me, of course, you know, there's, there's people, there are government officials that I'm in the process of reaching out 
two to try to get more protection and at that time that I do that I will definitely share you know with you guys information about like you know even just making calls to local politicians here is helpful even if it's in English and not Spanish um, you know letting people know that you care and this is a recognized international and treasure that we want to protect makes a big difference the other thing that we're working on right now is actually um, just pulling together resources to potentially buy some of the land that the developers own right now before it gets developed so we're at this critical point where there's been a lot of development and there's a lot of development on the precipice but a lot of these lots are up for sale and it's millions of dollars right okay it's not hundreds of thousands I wish it was hundreds of thousands but it's you know it's acres and acres and acres and if we had more people that you know wanted to buy the land and do either sustainable development of the land right so integrating like um, you know community resources mm -hmm. uh, maybe an education building for, for or students even like a release come. site for endangered species. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I know the scarlet macaw is a threatened species in Costa Rica, if not endangered. And and you're talking about p buying this land as conservation, exactly. and investing in the future of our endangered wildlife. And honestly, yeah. I want to do that. I want to take your example and lead the way too. And maybe I one day it. I'll buy conservation easement and and work with the macaw recovery network as a release site like yeah. honestly you heard it here first let this be the first time you let's hear it let's manifest it's going it. to happen now <laughs> i love it yeah no i mean like if if someone's out there sitting on a couple million dollars give, <laughs> let's buy some land and and call up those it, donors you know it's it's and it's we've identified the areas of like the critical habitat, critical habitat where if it's destroyed we're you know it's the, the damage right. will be will be consequential for right. it will be it will be worst case scenario and the best know? thing we can do for wildlife is buy land and preserve it yeah. and create corridors and yeah. and crossings for these for these wildlife to to cross safely like the howler monkeys and, yeah. and the scarlet macaws here i'm learning so much just from this conversation about all the protection that needs to be done and i think it does start with protecting the land and and sustainably sourcing materials and and stewarding the land right mm -hmm. and that's what you've mm -hmm. done here at soul sanctuary and it's so amazing that we've gotten to experience it firsthand and hear the start of your story and how it's still just at the genesis and the birth of it and yeah um, there's so much exciting stuff in the works and i think we should definitely do a follow-up about what happens when the wildlife hospital is built and when yeah. you can have more volunteers here and i know i have some really amazing and special friends who have different skills to provide yeah. that would love to come down here and like this is really just the start of so much more. And you talk about wanting to go to Bolivia and Africa, and I'm going to Africa this summer to study human wildlife coexistence and Amazing. community science. Like this is really the connection here that we're trying to bridge. And, yeah. and I'm just so excited about it. Well, I'm really grateful for you guys, and I'm really proud of the work that you're doing. Thank and you, that's thank so you sweet Thank you for of you. spreading the message. And Yes, it's been a great interview. And, and also for, you know, looking for ways to support and asking how you can help. And, um, you know, I think, even people don't realize like you know you might not have the money to come to Costa Rica but come as a volunteer right like these are these are ways that people there's ways that we can get creative and we can work together and um, and I think Coral was able to get a last minute flight down here round trip for 300 bucks right I mean you know like it's doable we, we can do this thing and and we just need we just need people whose hearts and souls are in the right place and who want to make a difference and and if you can't come down here for whatever reason mm -hmm. um, you know you is spread the word spread the message share Break with your friends action. share your podcast with people right like like follow subscribe support send it to someone that you know can support totally. like people don't realize like the the power that they actually have of like where you put your money what you support and also just like what you talk about and what you spread and share with the Absolutely. world is like it makes a huge difference for me so many of the people that I have that are coming here to teach retreats like the yoga instructors and meditation and Qigong people like they're people that heard about us not because they stumbled down here but they might live in Canada and like one of their friends told them like mm -hmm. hey there's this cool place right and so then that brings a whole retreat here for me and and it's just it brought us here yeah yoga maybe you're a yoga instructor maybe you teach Pilates maybe you teach meditation maybe you're a life coach you know I have people from all over the world that uh, have heard about this place and come down here just through word of mouth like some people that don't 
don't even know someone that's ever been here, but they just love the concept. They love being able to help and support wildlife through the work they're doing. And, you know, maybe you come and host a retreat. It doesn't cost you anything because you you bring six people down here and mm -hmm. that pays for your time here. So there's so many creative ways that we can work together and just, um, you know, s spreading the word and spreading the message and the good work that, that we're subscribe, doing. And follow, like, subscribe, follow, like, all that share. Good stuff. It, you know, it makes us a huge difference. And, and honestly, gratitude to the people that spent an hour of their time listening to us talk. Like I was telling right. you, like <laughs> I, I'm so grateful to even sit down and have these conversations because it's all in my head. Right. And I'm just running a million miles an hour trying to do the best I can. But like, I can't do it on my own. Mm -hmm. I need help. It's like mm -hmm. Marine Mammal Care Center. I couldn't have done that on my own. Absolutely. I need everyone's help I couldn't help and be support. here today without Coral. Yeah, You think exactly. I could set up all this podcast here without her? Yeah. I'm so grateful to have a creative director and it takes courage it to ask for help and yeah. that is something I'm learning and I feel you on having all these ideas running through your head and that's why yeah. journaling is so powerful for me yeah. because you bring your ideas to life as soon as they leave your head because your thoughts are invisible yeah. and if you let them stay invisible, how does anything become real? How do you take action? How do you be about it? You yeah. can't just talk about it. Conservation isn't just talking, it's action yeah. and I think so much people do talking and there's this doomsday effect where maybe they aren't even doing enough talking and that's why just having a conversation about climate change alone and the impacts of it's having on wildlife it really starts with communication yeah. so what is that call to action that our listeners can take in terms of yeah following you guys we want to plug soul sanctuary information wildlife protection alliance mm -hmm. um, how can we find you how can our listeners find you yeah, so um, our Instagram for Wildlife Protection Alliance is conveniently at Respect the Wildlife. So great, we will check share us that out there. for sure. And then it, for the retreat center, it's at Sol S O L, which means sun in in Spanish. And then it, so it's S O L underscore sanctuary or save one life <laughs> underscore sanctuary, S O L. However you want to think about that. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, call, like my call to action for people is often just, you know, because of the compassion fatigue and a lot of people feeling like it's doom and gloom and what do I do out there? And I just tell people like, look, you, you make choices all day. You make choices every day. Make the best choice for you and the planet, right? Period. S planet people. That's right? how we come together you with know? this unison idea of stewardship and understanding and, and it starts with you. Yeah, and it's just, it's, a, it, it's, it's easy little choices and eventually those choices will aggregate mm -hmm. and, it, and you'll make a difference and it's where do you choose to spend your money? Like, do you book a hotel that says they're eco-friendly but they don't, they aren't, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, oh, and pay attention. Pay attention, right? That's that's kind of that's what, a good call to action. It's what that we simple. need to do here listen, is tune in, tune in, tune wake in, up, wake, wake up. up. You know, it's like we're so <laughs> on up. our devices. <laughs> I know we're so just in in the in the zone of like what right. the programming that we're being fed, and it's like just open your eyes, look around you, see the beauty around listen you, listen to the, the birds. Yeah. that is my first yeah. step. That is yeah. my first call to action for anyone to take. Conservation starts in your backyard, and for me, that was backyard bird watching. Uh -huh. Bird watching is the gateway to the wildlife world. They mm. are abundant, they are, are diverse, challenging to ID. If you gamify bird watching, yeah. it becomes a whole new, exciting thing for people to challenge you. And then I you get curious, it. and then you want to know more, and, and then suddenly you have to learn about the plants that attract the birds, and, and oh, what's burrowing under this plant? Is that a snake? Oh, cool, right. lizards and snakes, now I'm into that. It's like, yeah. it's literally just wake up, look around you yeah. here, yeah. and it's meditative. Yeah. Bird watching can heal your soul in so yeah. many ways because it takes you outside of yourself, like yeah. we talked about earlier. Yeah. And it's so easy to just get trapped in your own anxiety and running thoughts or maybe depression and all of these these things that our devices instill in us and we're trapped inside and it's like just listen. And yeah. that's why I'm so glad we're we're in this yoga studio today outside because we get to bring nature to life in this mm -hmm. podcast. And mm -hmm. I really hope all of our listeners are excited to hear these sounds because I love hearing them and seeing all the birds I, And also us. you can even hear the ocean. I don't know if it's picking yes. up on that, but yeah. Oh yeah. It's oh. actually picking up more um, for this part than it is. It sounds louder. Yeah, I think it's it probably high, high tide. tide. Yeah. Well, yeah. look at that. See, we can we can pay attention to those things because yeah. we're outside. Well, we're, you we're do. Awoken. You have to tune in. Oh, there's a hummingbird right there behind oh, you. Beautiful. Speaking of which. Oh my gosh. <gasps> oh my gosh. In the in it's the so flowers. Pretty. Well, and so, a lot of people ask me too, why Costa Rica, right? 
and I told you I have my eye on places all over the world, but um, you know, Costa Rica just has, it has a lot to offer. And you, you know, bird watching in your backyard is a great idea, but when you come here and you see 10 species in one hour and some of them 20, might be endangered, 25. you know, yeah. it, 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 we're fast tracking that experience. And so, you know, the whole idea of reconnecting people to nature and connecting them to wildlife, I might have a week with people, but like it will change your life. You know, in one week I can change your life. I can hopefully reconnect you with the earth and nature and re-inspire you and reinvigorate you and get you where you need to be so that you go back into the world that's so disconnected yes, and so right. we're on this rat race hamster track in a concrete right. jungle but like you will be able to like you will have integrated those experiences and you'll take that back with you and you'll right. be able to share and spread the word and spread the message and um now i'm getting know. distracted by all the so birds. <laughs> so that's why this place has just a lot of magic to offer and it's magic. another reason we have to protect it right yes. because it hasn't been turned into a concrete jungle yet yes. but if a lot of people coming from european and western countries mm -hmm. keep coming the way they're coming mm -hmm. and approaching it the way they're approaching we will pave paradise you know that song like pave paradise no. put up a park oh, and oh. I think it's cheryl crow that's what they're freaking oh doing gosh. here, right? Like, it's like, gave that oh. gave me chills. That gave me chills. first concert ever. No up. way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's, Whoa. I never understood the meaning of those words. Not until honestly, I moved no. here, right? Oh my, oh my gosh. Yeah. And it's like, <gasps> like, we can't let that happen, you know? How like, did I not even know the meaning of that? Yeah. yeah, no, you didn't. You just sang it and you didn't think about it. And now you're like, this, like, here we Pay are, paradise you know? and put up a parking lot. Yeah. Let's prevent that. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. And so, that's like, what we're preventing by having this podcast, spreading awareness, putting the message out doing there. Doing a Cheryl Crow benefit Oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, don't even Cheryl get me Crow. started. Don't even get me started on the benefit concerts. Oh. I want to host a benefit concert one day. I love it. I love it. Oh, my it. gosh. So that's a whole musicians. nother conversation. Yes. Who wants yeah. to do oh. that? Oh, oh are we going there next? I I'm ready it. to go I there next. Let's Trust me. Let's yeah. do it. Actually, so for Marine Mammal Care Center, just <laughs> while we're on it, this will be our last thing because we got we to gotta <laughs> cut it off. But... Um, I did a, um, one of the million dollar campaign things was uh, my, one of my wild ideas, you know, kind of like wearing a mermaid costume, was to do a fundraiser at the aquarium, the Long Beach Aquarium. Oh, yeah. And I didn't do a traditional fundraiser. I did a electronic music fundraiser. Wow. And so yeah. we got EDM That's DJs awesome. from all over the world, like some really well-known like ones. Autograph, I don't even know. Yeah, that was our headliner. Autograph. autograph. Um, we had quite a few different amazing oh my DJs. Gosh. And, this is awesome. Um, and they all came together and they just donated their time and they came in service and we called it Electric Sea. And we had like 1,500 That's people so cool. that descended on the aquarium. You wow. can imagine that they never invited us back after this. Don't oh, worry, dear. we did it in areas where it wasn't, the music wasn't impacting the animals, because of sure, course I thought of, of that. Um, oh, but it was funny. amazing. And we raised like, I think we raised like close to $100,000 just lot. in that event alone. Oh my gosh. But you know, like this is the power of like creativity. Yes, and, innovation, you know, and action. People, people that maybe are not necessarily working in the conservation space, but mm -hmm. boom, you have a skill, take it and use it and help the animals, you know? Period. So get creative we're, we're ready to hear all your creative ideas about how we can save the wildlife <laughs> oh, there's plenty of ideas and this is just the beginning I i'm excited it. to work together I love it. <laughs> awesome well thank cool. you guys so thank much for coming so much. out oh my gosh gratitude. thank you for everything this is and incredible this is just the beginning yes woohoo yay <laughs> Thank you all so much for tuning in to this episode and interview with Amber Barcera. We had so much fun staying at the Soul Sanctuary and really connecting with nature and ourselves as we learn how to protect the environment. You can't protect what you can't care about. And we're lucky enough that we had the experience to see howler monkeys firsthand and feel the joy that we get from seeing these animals and in turn, how we can use that joy to protect them. To learn more about Amber's Retreat Center, you can find more information online on Amber's Soul Sanctuary website, www.soul-sanctuary.com, and on Instagram at soul underscore sanctuary. Make sure you follow along on the Respect the Wildlife page as well 
to learn more about the Wildlife Protection Alliance on Instagram at Respect the Wildlife. Make sure you also check us out on our own Instagram page at planet.people.pod. Or you can find me on TikTok at NAT underscore U-R-A-L-I-S-T-J-N-E. We post a ton of content about our guest episodes and the fun adventures and stories we share along the way. Thanks so much for tuning in, and we can't wait to have you back on for the next episode. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Planet People. We are thrilled to have you as part of our community of wildlifers who care about protecting the planet for future generations to enjoy. We hope that by listening to this podcast, you'll be inspired to connect with nature and become a steward of the planet by getting involved and taking action with your local community conservation organization. Until next time, stay positive, Planet People. Thank you to my team here at Planet People. This episode was produced by Natalie Jane Sybil, Coral Carson, and Hugh Carr. Edited by Coral Carson. Theme song by Hugh Carr under the artist name Flama. Thank you, team.